So far, we've been using the decision shape to implement all of the conditional logic within our orchestrations, and it's a pretty useful shape. But imagine how complex our orchestrations would become if we had to use a decision shape every time we wanted to evaluate a condition. Well, what other options do we have? Well, we know that we could implement a helper method on a class that could handle more complex logic and then just return a Boolean. But that approach has some drawbacks as well. What would happen, for example, if the conditional logic itself needed to change on a regular basis? And that's entirely possible for certain types of business processes. Our order processing orchestration, for example, might have to deal with the fact that we send out special offers every week. And each of those special offers could require a different set of conditions for an order to qualify for a discount. One week, for example, we might offer free shipping on orders for a certain product. Other weeks, we might offer 10% off on orders over $100. Now, if we have implemented all of that conditional logic in a helper method, and our helper method can't accommodate a certain special offer scenario, we might have to make a code change and then recompile that assembly and deploy it out to the servers in the BizTalk group and then restart the host instances. Well, that's gonna have a pretty severe impact on the agility of our order processing orchestration. So rather than limit the types of special offers that we can handle, maybe we should think about a different approach. This is a situation in which we could use BizTalk's business rules engine. And in doing so, we could address these types of concerns up front. In this module, we're going to gain an understanding of how we can apply BizTalk's business rules engine to our applications. As usual, we're going to cover the concepts first. We'll talk about what the business rules engine actually is and what we can do with it and get an understanding of how it actually works. And then after that, we'll talk about what it takes to incorporate business rules into our applications. I'll show you the business rule composer, a tool that you can use to create new business rules. And then I'll show you tools that you can use for deployment and versioning. And then I'll also show you how you can turn on tracking so that you can see exactly what's happening as your policies are executing in the runtime. So what exactly is a business rules engine? Well, the concepts behind rules engines have been around for quite a while, actually. They're rooted in the research and development work that was done in the 1960s and 70s with the goal of creating an expert system. That is a system that can simulate human thinking. So that can become some pretty complex stuff. BizTalk then is just bringing that work forward and making it more accessible by providing a set of tools that we can use to work with this rules engine. But every once in a while, you're gonna hear a term pop up and it might sound strange to you at first. But that's just terminology that came back from that artificial intelligence research way back when. So in this lesson, we'll talk about what business rules actually are and how the BizTalk rule engine processes them. And we'll get an understanding of how we can use them in an app and where they might be useful. The tool set for working with BizTalk's business rule engine was developed with a few different types of users in mind. And so I'll talk about those different roles. I'll talk about how developers might use the tools, as well as business analysts or information workers, as well as administrators. So let's get started. All right, well, let's dig into the business rule engine and see what it's all about. Let's start off by talking about what it's made of. The rule engine is composed of a few different parts. First of all, there is a database known as the rule store. So any rule that the business rule engine is going to be processed will be stored in this database. Then there is a runtime DLL that actually implements the business rule engine and it knows how to execute the rules. There is also a Windows service that sends out notifications when any new collections of rules have been deployed. A collection of rules, by the way, is known as a policy. And finally, there is a set of tools made available that we can use to develop and test and deploy these rules. Now at runtime, any application that is going to use the business rule engine needs to load the rule engine runtime DLL. So we could have many instances of the rule engine running on different servers in a BizTalk group. Each instance of the rule engine is going to maintain a cache of the rules that it reads from the rule store database. And then when it's asked to execute a policy, it's going to read that collection of rules from its cache and process whatever data is passed to it. Now, the thing that makes this all very interesting is the deployment model. As you create new sets of rules and test them and save them off, they're all going to be saved in the rule store database. When you've completed your initial testing, you're going to publish your rules. And all that really is, 
is an update to a status field in the database. Once you've published a version of your policy, you can no longer change it. It becomes read-only. If you wanted to make changes, you would need to create a copy of that policy and edit the copy. Now, simply publishing a policy will not make those rules available to the BizTalk runtime. When you are ready to make the rules available to the BizTalk runtime, you'll need to make another status change. You will need to mark your rules as deployed. Once you mark your rules as deployed, the Rule Engine Update service is going to send out a notification to every instance of the Business Rule Engine runtime. Then, each instance of the Business Rule Engine knows that it needs to contact the Rule Store database to load the latest version of your policy. Now, what's interesting about this is that it allows us to do real-time updates without requiring any compilation. And those updates are communicated to all of the servers in our BizTalk group. All right, the next thing to talk about is where we can use something like this. Well, one scenario that you might encounter from time to time is a need for higher level validation. What I mean by that is that we often encounter a need for something more than schema validation. For example, if we have a policy that evaluates line items in purchase orders, it might need to be able to determine whether a product can be ordered by weight or if it should be ordered by volume. That's not something that we could get from schema validation but it is something that we could implement as a business rule. Another potential use is that it might be possible to automate certain types of decisions. You might be able to define a set of rules that can automatically approve or deny certain types of purchases. Another potential use is that you might be able to create a set of rules that determine when a notification needs to be sent out. For example, you might be able to implement a policy that performs some sort of fraud detection. And if it identifies something suspicious, it can send out a notification and somebody can investigate. Sometimes it makes sense to use the business rule engine to help route messages. We might, for example, be able to define a policy that knows how to identify a high priority purchase order. The policy might evaluate a set of fields in the purchase order and then set a property on that purchase order message to indicate that that message should be sent to a special orchestration that's designed to handle expedited orders. You can see a few simple examples of some business rules at the bottom of this slide. These rules might be used to evaluate a new order. And the first one is checking if this is a customer that we already know about. So when this rule actually runs, it is quite likely reading a customer ID from an XML message and then querying a database to see if that ID exists. And then if it finds that customer in the database, it is quite likely setting a field on the order message to indicate that this is a known customer. And the second example, checking for a known product is similar to the check for a known customer. And then finally, we have a rule checking to see if the product is available and in inventory. And in this case, the rule is checking the database to see if the quantity on hand is low. And if it is, then it should issue an order for new stock. Well, before we go any further, we should probably stop and define some terms that we're encountering. First of all, there's the term rule itself. A rule is basically an if-then statement. There's really more to it than that, but that will serve as a starting point. So the if clause is simply a logical condition that evaluates to true or false. And the then clause specifies a series of actions that need to be taken if the condition evaluates to true. Now rules operate on facts. Conditions check facts and actions update facts. You can just think of facts as variables that identify some item of data. Now, a rule doesn't stand on its own. It's always going to be part of a policy. A policy is a collection of rules that operate together, and the policy defines a scope. In other words, a rule in one policy is not visible to a rule in another policy. And one other thing to note about policies is that they serve as a unit of versioning and deployment. You cannot deploy an individual rule. You always need to deploy a policy. And if you're going to make a change to a rule, you need to make that to a new version of the policy that contains that rule. One thing that we haven't talked about yet are business rule vocabularies. 
You can think of a vocabulary as a collection of friendly names for the facts that you will be using to create your rules. You could say that a business rule vocabulary term is like a variable name for a fact. Now, vocabularies are not absolutely required, but they are very helpful. They make it much easier to read and maintain your policies. Okay, now that we've gotten some of the terminology out of the way, let's spend a minute to gain a better understanding of what a business rule actually is. We know that a rule is like an if-then statement. It operates on these things called facts, which are really like variables. And a fact ultimately maps to an object or a field originating in some data source. Okay, well, let's talk about the sources of facts. Some of the facts that you might work with originate in XML documents. So in the example we talked about earlier, we were reading a customer ID from an XML document. And then in that same example, we were reading a field from a table in a SQL database. It's also possible to have a fact that maps to a property on a .NET class. And then it's also possible to define facts that are simply constants. Okay, the condition of our rule is going to evaluate facts, and then the actions in our rules are going to update facts. Now I mentioned that a rule is like an if-then statement, but not exactly. And there are two key differences that I'd like to point out. First of all, it's very common to define a fact with a data access expression that returns multiple values. We might, for example, have a fact that maps to the SKU of a line item in a purchase order. Well, if our purchase order has more than one line item, we're going to end up with more than one instance of that fact. In that case, our rule is going to act more like a for each loop to process each of those SKUs rather than a simple if-then statement. The other difference to keep in mind is that the action of a rule does not execute immediately after the rule's condition evaluates to true. The execution of the action is actually deferred. The conditions of all of the rules are checked first before any actions are taken. I'm going to talk more about that later when we actually walk through the sequence that the rule engine follows to process a policy. So the rule engine is very careful about the way in which it manages the data that's passed to it. It's going to try to optimize any sort of data access that it needs to perform. You're going to encounter a couple of terms that relate to the way the rule engine manages a collection of facts. It uses the term assert to indicate that a fact is being added to the working memory of the rule engine. And then it uses the term retract to indicate that it is removing a fact from memory and that fact is no longer being used. You'll also hear the term long-term fact, and that would be for something like a cached value. There might be a list of product codes, for example, and that list is only updated every 24 hours. So it might make sense to cache that list in memory. So long-term facts allow you to implement caching, but it is going to require some custom code to make that possible. One thing about rules is that they don't support else clauses. So to implement something like an else clause, you need to create a second rule. And the second rule needs to check the opposite condition. As you're creating the conditions for your rules, you have a number of comparison operators available to you. You could use the greater than, less than, equal, and not equal operators. There are also some date comparison operators, so you can compare if a date is before or after another date. You can also check to see if a date falls within a given range. There's an operator that allows you to check numerical ranges, and there's even an operator that allows you to check if a string matches a regular expression. In addition, you can combine all of these comparisons using the logical AND, OR, and NOT operators. It's also possible to call .NET methods within your conditions. And that could be useful if you needed to do something like string concatenation, for example. The actions on your rules will most likely need to update some data, and so you'll do that by assigning new values to your facts. So it's quite likely you'll be able to copy the value from one fact to another to get that job done. But if you need to combine values, but the rule engine gives you access to some functions to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. It also gives you access to some time functions to extract hour, minute, seconds, and so forth. And again, you can call .NET methods. In addition, you have access to a collection of engine control functions. You can actually tell the rule engine to stop executing. 
You can add new data into the working memory of the rule engine by asserting a fact, or you can retract facts, or you can tell the rule engine that you want it to update a fact. When you first start working with the rule engine, it can take a little while to get used to the sequence that it follows to execute a policy. BizTalk's rule engine is actually what's known as a forward chaining inference engine, which means that it can attempt to simulate human thinking. It's possible, for example, to instruct the rule engine to make more than one pass through a policy, which allows it to pick up new information and evaluate new conditions as it makes each pass. Now, of course, not every policy needs to take advantage of forward chaining, but it's a good idea to spend a few minutes to get a basic understanding of the rule engine's execution sequence. So in the first step, we initialize the rule engine with a set of data. The engine isn't very demanding, it will attempt to work with whatever data that we provide, and it will use that as a starting point. Once the initial facts are asserted, the engine will begin evaluating rule conditions. So it's going to do this using a fast pattern matching algorithm known as the RETI algorithm. If a rule condition evaluates to true during the match phase, then that rule's actions are added to a list. And that list of scheduled actions is known as the agenda. By the way, the rule engine does not consider it to be an error if it does not have the facts that are required to evaluate the condition for some given rule. In those cases, that rule is simply ignored. Once the match phase is complete and the agenda has been updated, then the actions will be sorted by priority. You'll hear of this referred to as the conflict resolution phase. The priority that I'm talking about here is a property of the rule. As you create or edit a rule, you can set an integer value to specify its priority. All rules default to a priority of zero, but if your policy requires actions to run in a certain order, you can assign rule priorities accordingly. Now, once the agenda items have been sorted by rule priority, the rule engine will execute the actions on the agenda from top to bottom. Once it has completed that, it will then retract any facts that it has in memory and the execution is complete. So it's actually pretty straightforward. The complexity starts to creep in if you make use of any of the engine control functions, particularly if one of your actions asserts a new fact, or if you call the engine controls update fact. In that case, the engine now has new information that it needs to use to evaluate all of the other rules in the policy. So when the rule engine encounters an action that asserts or updates a fact, it is going to complete executing the remaining actions for that rule, and then it is immediately going to return to the match phase. And then once that iteration of the match phase is complete, it will resort the agenda, and then once again begin at the top of the agenda and attempt to execute from top to bottom. Now, the orchestration designer really makes it very easy to implement a call to a business rule policy from an orchestration. I'm going to talk more about the specifics on that later, but for the moment, I would just like to consider a few scenarios in which you might want to do such a thing. We've already talked a little bit about the possibility of using the business rule engine to help us implement some sort of dynamic routing of messages. And actually, the most straightforward way to do that would be to invoke a business rule policy from an orchestration. So as an example, we might have a set of orchestrations that know how to process orders. One of these orchestrations might implement a process for handling expedited orders. Another one might handle orders for products that require special shipping arrangements. And we might have one other orchestration that processes all other order types. In a case like that, it can make a lot of sense to create a new orchestration that does nothing but route orders. It could examine an incoming order and determine if it needs to be expedited, and if so, send it on to the orchestration that handles expedited orders. The actual routing rules could be implemented in a business rule policy, so this orchestration that's responsible for routing these messages could simply accept an order message, invoke a business rule policy passing this message, allow the policy to examine the order and make a determination of how that order should be processed, if the policy then updates a field on that order message, when the orchestration gets that message back, it can examine that field 
and route the message accordingly. The really nice thing about that is that as the routing rules change over time, we can update the business rules as those conditions change, and the orchestrations themselves do not need to change. A second scenario that to think about is a condition in which we need to determine a delay period. In other words, we'd like to send a message to a business rule policy, allow it to examine our message, and then tell us how long we should wait for a response to arrive. We can use the value that the business rule policy returns to initialize a delay within a listen shape. We might have a situation, for example, where payment terms depend on an agreement negotiated with each customer, but then it might also depend on the type of order. In that case, we might be able to encapsulate those conditions in a business rule policy. And when the orchestration comes to the point at which it is waiting for payment, and allow the policy to determine how long the orchestration should wait for the payment message to arrive. We can update the business rules to reflect those changes and the orchestration doesn't have to change. In other cases, it might make sense to take a look at our orchestration and examine the decision logic that we've encoded within decision shapes. And we may find that it makes more sense to implement those conditions within a business rule policy rather than within decision shapes. We can let the business rule policy handle the more complex conditional logic. And when the orchestration calls it and receives the message back, our decision shape can simply examine the result passed back from the business rule engine and branch accordingly. And once again, if any of those conditions change, we can update the business rule policy and the orchestration itself doesn't have to change. If you incorporate the business rule engine into any of your applications, it's going to be important to know who's responsible for which tasks. So those tasks will be divided amongst the developers and the information workers or business analysts and the BizTalk administrators. And it's quite likely that those roles could overlap to some degree. Developers, for example, will need to perform some of the administration tasks on their own workstations and perhaps even in some testing environments. So as a guide, you can probably expect that developers will be responsible for creating and maintaining vocabularies. And the reason for that is that the vocabularies consist of friendly names that kind of mask the details of these data access expressions. So a vocabulary is going to involve XPath statements and perhaps SQL queries and so forth. You can probably also expect that developers will be creating and testing a fair number of policies, whether they receive a specification from a business analyst or whether it's a specification that you write for yourself. You might find yourself, in some cases, creating policies to help reduce the complexity within a given orchestration. And if an orchestration is going to call a business rule policy, of course, it's going to be the developer's job to implement that call in the orchestration. By the way, one other potential task that a developer might encounter is that it's possible to use the business rule engine outside of BizTalk orchestrations. In other words, you can take advantage of the .NET object model that's provided by the business rule framework to make use of business rules in other applications that you might be developing. In some cases, you might have a business analyst who can grow comfortable working with the tools that are provided to work with a business rule engine. It might not pose any problem to them to create policies and update policies. On the other hand, the technicalities of the business rule engine might be too overwhelming for some people. And so the burden might fall more on the developer to create and maintain policies. In either case, I think a developer can expect to be involved in the development of vocabularies. Now, looking from the perspective of an administrator, in general, an administrator is simply going to make use of the tools that are required to migrate and deploy policies. An administrator also might get involved in configuring security as a policy is deployed. The user interface does not provide a means to configure this security, but the documentation for the rule engine shows how it can be done using script. In fact, the security of each policy and of each vocabulary can be configured independently. So someone might have access to make changes to a policy, but they can't change the vocabulary terms that are used to create that policy. It will also be up to an administrator to control the tracking of a business rule policy. They can use the BizTalk administration console to enable and disable that tracking.
And as a developer, you might find yourself making use of that tracking capability in your own testing environment. Okay, let's move on and start talking about how we can create business rules and apply them to our applications. I'm gonna start off by walking you through the process of developing a business rule policy. And then I'll show you the tool that you can use. It's known as the Business Rule Composer. And then once we have a business rule policy in place, I'll show you how you can call that from an orchestration. And then we'll close out this lesson by talking about deployment and tracking. So for the most part, writing a business rule policy is going to feel like any other form of programming. So as always, you'll want to start off with a specification. And ultimately, what you need to derive from that specification are those if-then conditions that you can use to implement your rules. So as you read that spec, you can be looking for those conditions. And you'll also want to identify the facts that you'll be using to implement those rules. Now, there might be a fair amount of research involved in identifying all of the sources of data for your facts. So you'll want to make sure that you have that well documented. And then once you have those facts and sources identified, you can start defining vocabulary terms. And you'll use the business rule composer to create vocabulary terms. Depending on the complexity of your application, it might make sense to create more than one vocabulary. You might even find yourself creating one vocabulary per data source. Once you have the vocabulary terms complete, you'll need to publish those vocabularies before you can use them in any rules. And once you publish a vocabulary, it's going to be immutable. So if you want to make changes to that vocabulary, you'll need to create a copy of it and then make changes to the copy and then publish that new version. So then once you have your vocabularies defined, you can start implementing the rules using the Business Rule Composer. As you're developing your rules in the Business Rule Composer, you can use it to perform quick and simple tests of your rules. But ultimately, you might find that a unit testing framework such as BizUnit might help you achieve more effective testing. Once you've finished your development and initial testing in the Business Rule Composer, then when you want to test your orchestration and policy out in the runtime environment, you'll need to deploy your orchestration, and then you'll need to mark your policy as deployed as well. Once you have both of those deployed, you can start testing in the runtime environment. Then when it comes time to migrate to a new testing environment, there's a tool that you can use to export the rules from your development environment to an XML file. You can move that XML file to a new testing environment and import those rules there. So here's a screenshot of the Business Rule Composer. This is the tool that we'll be using to create new vocabularies and rules. And this is the same tool that a business analyst would use to either view or edit rules. And a BizTalk administrator will quite likely make use of this tool as well. So in addition to creating and editing our vocabularies and rules, we're going to use the Business Rule Composer to publish and deploy rules to our development environment. Now, if we have administrative privileges in our development environment, We'll have full control over any vocabularies and policies that we might create. Depending on your circumstances, you might be able to use this tool to view the rules in other environments, but it wouldn't be a real big surprise if your access to those rule databases was limited. In this demonstration, I'll show you how to open the Business Rule Composer and how to view policies and vocabularies. One version of the policy that we're going to look at does not make use of vocabulary terms, and the other one does. So you'll be able to see how much more readable a policy is when it makes use of vocabulary terms. After that, I'll show you how we can use the Business Rule Composer to test those policies. All right, well, let's start off this demonstration by opening the Business Rule Composer. And we can find that on the Start menu under the Microsoft BizTalk Server 2010 menu. And so you can see a few different windows. We have the Policy Explorer window, and we have the Vocabulary Explorer window, and then we have our Properties window. We have two versions of the Loan Approval Policy deployed. And you can see that these versions implement the same set of rules. One of these versions uses vocabulary terms, and the other one does not. Let's first take a look at the vocabulary terms themselves. So we have the loan process vocabulary, and there is one version of that. And one of the vocabulary terms provides the base income 
for a loan applicant. That base income value is read from an XML document. And if you look in the properties window, you can see that that is a system.decimal value. You can see a description. You can see that this definition originates in the loan application schema from our AdventureWorks solution. And then you can see the actual XPath statements. So the XPath selector specifies the record. And so this is taken from the income record of the loan application. And then the XPath field specifies the actual, where to find the actual value. And that comes from the basic salary element of the income record. Another vocabulary term is month range. And this defines a list of constants, so you could think of this as an enumerated value. You can see that month range is composed of integers. And you can see the list of integers here. When you make use of this vocabulary term in the Business Rule Composer, these values will be presented to you in a drop-down list. Now the next term I'd like to look at is the update loan status. And we can see that here. And this allows us to set the value of an element within the loan application document. So you can see that this value is a string. And there's a string here that defines the prompt that will show up when we're going to set this value in our business rule. And as before, you can see the selector that defines where the record is located. It's the loan conditions record. And you can see the definition of the actual field that contains the value. It's an attribute named loan status. Let's take a look at these policies. Now, version 1.1 of this policy does not make use of the vocabulary terms. So if we click on this approved rule, this functions correctly, but you can see that these rules contain the entire XPath expression that's required to access each value. You can see that we're updating the loan status here and checking the basic salary and other income field here to ensure that they are greater than the loan amount. If we look at the equivalent rule in version 1.0, this one does make use of the vocabulary terms. So you can see that it's a lot more readable. We can see that monthly base income plus secondary income is compared against the requested loan amount, as well as months employed in our current residence. Now I'd like to test this policy. So here we have our test data. We have a set of loan applications one that will be denied and one that will be approved. I made copies of each of these files because the rule engine is going to modify whatever file we provide as test data. So I'll keep a master copy in reserve. But here you can see the loan application that will qualify for approval, the basic salary, and the time and months at employment and residency exceed six months. The loan application that will be denied has basic salary that is less than the loan amount, and the time of employment and residency are less than six months. Okay, well, let's use the Business Rule Composer to run a test. I can test this policy by right-clicking 
and then choosing test policy. And the test interface is prompting me to provide a loan application document. So I'll do that by clicking on Add Instance. I'll find those under the Module 11 folder. And here we have the loan application document that we can test for the approval conditions. And then click Open. OK, I'll click Test to initiate the test. And you can see a trace of the activity that took place when this policy was executed. It's listing each of the facts that was asserted into the engine, each condition evaluation that took place during the match phase, each agenda update that took place, and then each agenda item that actually executed. And finally, all of the facts that were retracted. Let's go look at the result here. You can see that the file was updated. And the loan status has been set to approved. And you can see that the loan to income ratio was calculated. OK, let's run the denied test case through. OK, I'll return to the business rule composer and right click on the policy version for testing and then select test policy. And now we don't want to retest that same condition, so I'll select that instance and remove it. And then I'll add in a new document. So this will be the loan application denied document. And once again, click test. And you can see the trace that was created. And this time, if we go look at the denied document, you can see that the status was set to denied in this case. OK. We're going to revisit this scenario when we're ready to call this policy from an orchestration. When it comes to deployment and migration of business rules, you have a few different options available. First of all, in your own development environment, it's going to be easiest to use the Business Rule Composer to do the initial deployment of your policies. The Business Rule Composer also makes it possible to undeploy and delete policies that you're no longer using. Now, when you need to move your policies from your development environment to a testing environment, you have a couple of other options. One, you can use the Business Rule Engine Deployment Wizard to export your vocabularies and policies out to XML files, and then copy those over to the new testing environment and import them there. Another option that's available to you is to assign those rules to a BizTalk application. You can do that by opening the BizTalk Administration Console, selecting the application that makes use of your rules, click on that application's policy icon, and check the box on your policy to associate it with that application. Now that's not required for your application to make use of a policy. What this does do is when you export that application to an MSI file, those rules will be included in that MSI file. And when that MSI is imported into another BizTalk environment, those rules will be published to the Rule Engine database. Just be aware that if you associate a policy with an application, and you delete that application in the BizTalk Administration Console, it also automatically deletes the policy. So if you're going to make that association, make sure you keep a backup copy of your policy. Once you have your policy set up, it's a pretty simple process to set up a call to it from an orchestration. The way you create that is you add a call rule shape. And then as you're configuring that shape, you will simply select the name of the policy that you want to invoke. And then you'll need to configure the list of parameters that will be sent to the policy. Now, since the policy actually will be able to modify the message that you pass to it, it would be a good idea to construct an instance of your message that would be used strictly for processing by the business rule engine. 
You'll find it, by the way, that as you deploy new versions of your policy, the call rules shape will always execute the latest version of your policy. It is possible to specify which version of a policy you want to execute, but you can't do that with a call rules shape. You would need to add some custom code in an expression shape to make calls using the object model of the business rule framework. In this demonstration, I'll show you how to add a call rules shape to an orchestration, as well as how to configure it with the name of the policy and the list of parameters that need to be passed in. Okay, well, we're familiar with this policy now. Let's set up an orchestration to call the policy, and we can do that in Visual Studio. We're going to add this call to the process loans orchestration. So it's really very straightforward. You just go to the toolbox and find the call rules shape and drag that onto the design surface. I'll set the properties on this shape. And the most important one here is to select the policy that will be called. So I'll configure the policy. In this orchestration, we'll be making use of the loan approval policy. Now we need to send the XML document that will be processed here. And so that will be our loan app message. If our policy required any other information to process, and if we had variables of those types, those would have, we could have selected those from this list as well. Okay. And that's really all it takes to configure a call to a business rule policy. And when you get to the lab exercise, you'll be able to take this all the way through to completion. As you're testing your rules in the business rule composer, you get that trace of all that detail showing the execution sequence of the policy. Once you've deployed your policy out to the runtime environment, however, you lose all of that information. Well, there is a way to get access to that information, and you can go into the BizTalk administration console and find your policy, and you can enable some tracing options on it. There are four individual options. One option allows you to see when facts are asserted and retracted. One allows you to see the conditions that are evaluated. One allows you to see the rule firings. And another one allows you to see agenda updates. So you can choose any or all of those options and that tracking information would be collected for you. Once you've enabled tracking and you've sent messages through your environment, you'll be able to go back to query for that tracking data. But as always, anytime you enable any form of tracking, you need to be aware of the impact that it will have on the size of your tracking database. In this lab, you are going to create a business rule policy from scratch. So you'll start off by creating a set of vocabulary terms, and then you'll use those to create the business rule policy itself. Once you have that finished, you're going to incorporate that into the AdventureWorks application to handle automated approval of loans. You're also going to implement the manual approval process, which will require you to set up correlation, and loans that will require manual approval will be sent to SharePoint for review, and they will remain there until they have been approved or denied. And then the AdventureWorks app will read those back in and complete the processing.